Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Rachel Varga. I'm a board certified aesthetic nurse specialist. We have Katie Type A Biohacker, and you know we're becoming regular, uh, you know, live interviewees, interviewer. This is a really fun collaboration that we've um, started to do quite often here, popping on live, which is super fun. Yeah. So, if you're watching this on the Rachel Varga official Facebook or Rachel Varga YouTube, it's great because you're going to get to see me do some really funny faces today. And then also, if you're listening on the Rachel Varga podcast, welcome back. If you're a returning listener or viewer, it's so great to have you guys join us. And welcome, Katie. It's great to see you again. Oh, always good to see you, Rachel. Thank you so much. Yeah, I feel like we should, uh, we're, we'll be coming to a town near you guys soon. So be on the lookout for the Rachel and Katie show. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. We just have like this really great chemistry. Like you just really get what people want to know about skincare, rejuvenation, what are the gimmicks, what should we be avoiding. So I just absolutely love bringing you on and collaborating and helping you guys figure out what is, you know, safe, backed by research, the nuances of what you need to know about rejuvenation products and treatments, the science and all that cool stuff. So just checking in here, guys, because this is a live call. It is designed to be interactive. I do want to be able to answer some of your questions live. So simply leave a question in the comments section and then we'll get to your questions as we go through the presentation here. So Katie, what are we going to learn about today? So I want to learn about, you know, how I can get more glassy skin for the summer, what injectables are going to be right for me, what the budget is like, and all of those things. So I'm just so excited to kind of dive deep into this world that I actually haven't experimented with yet. Yeah, so we actually just did a deep dive. So tell us about how that went. Oh, fantastic. So we're gonna, we're just gonna kind of cover the highlights. Um, and I've certainly learned a lot. And uh, I'm excited for all of you to, to kind of get a little chance to kind of understand some of these things a little bit better. Yeah, we just went live in summer skin camp where we really kind of went into the nitty gritty de details on a lot of these topics. Mm -hmm. And so this is a more sort of like general live to give you guys a sneak peek as to uh, what we're talking about on some of the other programs that I have available, such as summer skin camp, or if you're listening or watching to this in the winter time in winter skin camp, because it's a good idea to actually switch up what you're doing seasonally to address your skin needs, whether you're more indoors and you know things are a little bit drier or you're outside and you're sweating more, how to counteract what's going on in the sort of inside environment and also uh, outside. So what we're gonna cover today is basically how injectables can even help with things like acne scarring and give you more of like that glassy look to your skin. Great. So I think like to kick things off, you know, I am in my early thirties getting, I'm starting to notice a couple of, you know, um, aging lines, mostly around my forehead. And so I was thinking like, what is a, the right time to start thinking about injectables? How early should you be looking into getting them? Yeah, this is a great question. And I really don't want people to be getting into the world of injectables too young right? It's important for us to be at peace with some of our wrinkles. Uh, not having any wrinkles is not a good look. And I would say the earlier you start to just really learn how to look after your skin through your skincare and what you're doing to feed and nourish the skin, how you're looking after yourself on the inside, that's really what you want to be doing first. So would I say that there's a specific age with how early you should be doing these uh, particular treatments? I'm not going to put a number on that. But what I will share with what I see people asking me very, very often is, you know, how do I get rid of forehead lines and things like that? Usually in like the, the 30s, 40s. And then there's big changes that happen uh, between the ages of sort of like the 50s and 60s, there's actually a scientific paper published in 2017 saying that women's faces change shape three times faster than their male counterparts 
between the ages of 50 to 60. So if you are a listener or a viewer in that age range, no, it's not in your head. There are specific things happening. So is there a specific age where you should start or stop doing these treatments? That's a completely personal um, question. And as you guys know, this is all educational information. Always check with your physician before having any um, any lifestyle modifications or treatments. It's really, really important. But what I do see are people younger and younger getting into these treatments, getting the big duck lips, things like that, wanting to freeze their foreheads. Do I like that? No. I want people to just start learning how to feed and nourish the skin at a younger age. So if I have someone coming to see me and they are you know, under 21, sorry, not gonna do it and you'd be surprised. Um, so I think it's just really important if you're a younger listener, which I do have a lot of young ladies tuning in and men, um, you know, just focus on like the skin health stuff first, but typically, you know, the 30s, the 40s, that's when people are going to mm -hmm. want to investigate these things a little bit further. Yeah, and then jumping off that point, once you do start, is it kind of like once you pop the fundo and stop, like you kind of have to keep consistent with it and like keep going at it every six months to a year? Or can you let a little bit of time pass and then get some, you know, down the line again? I recommend incorporating these more expensive in clinic rejuvenation options in a way that works with your budget and lifestyle and also in a way that makes you feel good if you're having you know anxiety about doing something or it's just not quite in alignment with how you're feeling on the inside don't do it nobody's making you get these treatments and in fact when i see these you know really young people or influencers online and they're getting these treatments done and they look great in their photos and then you know i see them in real life it's like they, they look crazy be more natural looking maintain the ideal ratios of the face don't go for an exaggerated look and and all of that um, you know natural is always going to be that that natural looks always going to be the classy look right and so it's important to not let the media try and tell you okay this is the new normal right the duck lips having the lips enter the room before um bef before the person does no, you just you just want to really maintain the health of the skin. That's really, really key. So say, for example, you've had a couple of treatments and then your lifestyles change. Say we've been on lockdown, all that stuff. No, your face isn't going to fall apart. Right. That's usually people's fear. It's like, OK, what if I start down this road of, of in clinic stuff and then stuff happens, clinics are closed or, you know, uh, things change in, in your lifestyle. Uh, you will have had a benefit when you were treated, but then being able to supplement what you're doing at home with your skincare, your rolling, your red light therapy, your healthy living practices based on what your genetic composition wants from you, which we can find out with these really cool lab tests, not just doing what the latest influencer is telling you to do, but really kind of going within what feels good for you. Tune into your body start to get intuitive with what your body's telling you. For example, what you're eating and drinking, how you're sleeping, how you're exercising, all of that, you definitely wanna prioritize more than just getting injectables. 100%, yeah, it's really about like laying down that foundation, that baseline, getting all of that in check before you start adding things like your disc board and your uh, Botox and Xeomin. And so kind of, you know, as we transition to talking a little bit more about those, what are some of the biggest differences that you can talk about between the three of them? And, you know, would what would somebody, um, you know, coming for a treatment, you know, prefer one over the other? Yeah, well, first of all, I do just kind of want to give a general PSA that if you say have an autoimmune condition or you're fighting something, whether it's, uh, you know, bacterial or viral infection, just not feeling great, don't do these treatments. No one's making you do these treatments. And if they are, obviously you need to have a conversation around that. Um, you don't need to do these treatments to feel and look beautiful. However, there are many options available. So without making any sort of drug claims and, and things like that, it's very important for us to follow what the research data is showing. So I wrote a paper last year. I won an award on this academically published article. You can just Google my name, Rachel Varga. You'll see my paper. It's you know, PubMed, for example, is where you can access that paper. And so in my paper, it's talking about rejuvenation to the eye area. There's a little table. 
and I list out the molecular weights of these particular products. Some of the molecular weights of the products are heavier and lighter than others. Some of these products have added ingredients that can actually, since 2013, have been studied to launch an immune response. Do I want to put that in my body that's going to launch an immune response? No. So I do have specific recommendations as to what I prefer at this time based on what the scientific literature is telling us. Um, these different products do have different feelings to them. So some of them are going to feel a little bit more stiffer and frozen. Some of them are going to feel a little bit softer than others. So it just depends on what your preference is as well. So you can have this conversation with your uh, professional provider, your aesthetic physician, your aesthetic nurse, or I go into, you know, the thick of this during a one on one consultation, either in the office, or, you know, if you're anywhere in the world, obviously, you can meet with me online through a virtual call, which can be scheduled at rachelvarga.ca, then we'll kind of get into, you know, which options could be available to address your skin goals. So I do have um, a preference with these products. And it's based on what the scientific data is telling us in respects to the weight and how they feel. And I've been doing these treatments for quite a while myself and I've definitely um, really liked the results with them. And then others, I haven't really liked the results with quite as much. Mm -hmm. Can you ever mix some of the, you know, the Botox with the Dysport, which, with the Xeomin? Do people ask for that when they come into the clinic? Or is that like a recommendation kind of based on um, what their end results are? This is a really interesting question because some of these particular products have certain nuances. Some of them are gonna create a more stiffer feel. Some of them are going to create a more softer feel. So it actually can sometimes be better to use certain products in certain areas and then other products in other areas. So that's determined based on what your specific goals are. I do have to be a little bit general on these uh, live informational educational calls for obvious reasons, because it's so different for everybody. But in terms of some of the trends that I'm seeing of creating cocktails and actually mixing some of these products together, I don't love because what's the final, you know, what's the final chemical composition and interaction if say you're mixing like a neuromodulator with a filler, with an antioxidant and doing like a cocktail, um, that's become a big trend is actually mixing them together and then doing some of these facial treatments. So that's become quite popular over the last year or two. And I like to see the data of at least about seven, eight years from now, just for the safety, because if you start to add things like antioxidants with other things, they could actually turn that antioxidant into a free radical, which could actually cause more harm than good. So it's really important to be quite conservative with a lot of these treatments and not go for like the shiny object syndrome or what's trendy or what the latest influencer is talking about. Mm -hmm. Now, looking at some of the kind of like, quote unquote, natural alternatives to Botox on the market right now, I stumbled on one called Betox. And this is like a bee venom facial. Uh, can you talk about this? And is this like a really popular trend in, in terms of like the realm of rejuvenation? There are certain active chemical components. And just so you know, the word chemical isn't a word to be afraid of. There's all this green washing, pink washing, blue washing, eco washing that happens with products. So if it says it's green, all natural, chemical free, like those actually don't have any valid um, weight in sort of like the chemistry perspective formulation world. However, there are some topical products that have a topical uh, change, uh, neuromodulator change to the skin, Matrixyl 3000 is one of them and some others, which is really quite neat. So what's, in, what's really key is to, you know, if you hear of these ingredients, look for the white papers, look for the academic articles to support these claims. Because what's happening is, um, you know, blanket claims are being made for certain trendy facial treatments or products 
but there's no scientific data to back it up. And unfortunately, there's no back of the bottle marketing police to do this. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you really just want to kind of follow the data with certain active ingredients. Yeah, that is, that's a really good point. And can you like ask your physician or, you know, who, you know, your aesthetic nurse specialist to give you like, you know, do you have any papers? Like when they, when they meet with you for a consultation, would you have that information readily available for them? Or do they have to kind of do all the legwork themselves? Yeah, I love pointing people in the right direction. However, not every aesthetic physician or aesthetic nurse really gets into this. So this is the same with any type of provider. If you have a forward thinking provider that's in the know of the latest in research because they're going to conferences, they're chatting with medical liaisons, they're writing academic papers themselves, that's really how you can differentiate between someone who really, you know, really puts into their work their all. And then others that, okay, they'll take their training and then they haven't done any additional training after their initial injectable training. So you can kind of navigate who is who when you talk to them and really try and glean from them how they are staying current in the industry? That's a really great question. Yeah, and it's so important. Um, so looking at like all of the different options that you can have for glassier, beautiful skin in the summer, I mean, we're talking about hydrofacials, lasers, you know, um, neuromodulators, what, what would be an ideal timeline? Would, I mean, obviously, you're not going to walk into the clinic and be like, I want all of them today. Maybe walk us through that. Yeah, so we just went into, you know, the thick of this in summer skin camp. And of course, I go into this more in one on one work. So if this is a question you're having of how do I integrate these options together, I do recommend that you just book a call, rachelvarga.ca or join the fun in summer skin camp. But I love to recommend that people first start to stabilize their skin. So cleansing the skin morning and night, moisturizing morning and night, sunscreen every day, exfoliating a couple times a week integrating dermal rolling, integrating actives like retinol, you know, maybe doing red light therapy, do that first, get your skin stable, do some of that heavy lifting at home, and then start to maybe think about getting some of these in clinic options. There's so many wonderful options, both at home and in clinic. However, certain people, uh, based on their, uh, if they have autoimmune conditions, or they're of certain skin types, they're not going to be candidates for certain treatments. So that's kind of why I can't like make blanket claims on these particular topics. However, balance your skin first, then maybe start to get some like skin boosting facial treatments done, uh, depending on what time of the year, uh, there's gonna be different options for lasers. And then I, I like to recommend doing the injectables if you're gonna do them, if you're a candidate, it's, it's been determined to be safe for you to do so by your physician then injectables can be a great option. But I would really prioritize that last and focus on your skin health. I just find when people do that, they live a healthy lifestyle in accordance to what their genes have to say and what their body has to say. And they, they're listening to their body all the time. This is the way to go. So mm -hmm. your skincare, your lasers, your injectables last, right? That's, yeah. uh, I'm a firm believer in that. But so that would be kind of like the order. And then in regards to downtime, it just depends what you're having done. And just in general, before having a treatment done, you avoid your actives like retinol for uh, you know a week before anything, uh, dermal rolling, same thing. And the same with afterwards, but there are specific things you need to know with laser treatments, if you can't have a tan or you can't have a tan, what type of uh, sun exposure. So obviously we're not gonna be diving into that because that's you know pretty nitty gritty. Yeah, so one of the things that's kind of been a barrier to entry for me is like, I'm deathly afraid of needles. So can you just kind of walk through like how painful are injectables for people? Yeah, this is such a great question. Everyone has a different pain threshold and you know anxiety around procedures, that's definitely a real thing. My mother is probably my most sensitive client. <laughs> so I also was a pediatric ICU nurse before getting into uh, medical aesthetics uh, about 10 years ago. So I was used to working with little ones that uh, breathed through tracheostomies and were on ventilators. So. I kind of have that ingrained in me to be very gentle and soft and things like that. And others, especially when I'm doing trainings and I'm seeing other injectors inject, they're like really heavy handed. They're kind of going in and digging and 
not good. So just because people are trained on treatments, it doesn't actually mean that they have the same sort of like touch, if you will. So I love recommending like a numbing cream with certain things just to make sure you're comfortable. And if you're going into a clinic and they're saying, oh no, we don't have time to do your numbing or no, it's not necessary. If you want it, request it and they should be accommodating to you. And if they're just wanting to, you know, get you in and out of the door and not um, do everything they can to make you feel as comfortable as possible, then move along and support somebody else. Such, such good advice. Now, when it comes to aftercare, should you stay out of the sun? Should you avoid putting on makeup? What are kind of like the aftercare protocol for Botox injections? This is a great question. So um, I'm not going to speak directly to this medication. Just ask your aesthetic provider uh, what they recommend specifically for you. I have to be very careful what I say for obvious reasons. However, Let's think about an acne scar, for example. If you have an acne scar or an acne you know, breakout pops up, you get that redness that sticks around for a while. That's called post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. There is a degree of inflammation that's happening to the skin. So when we're doing injectable procedures, again, we're using a little tiny needle. We're creating a little bit of, of dermal injury as well. So a good rule of thumb, if there's inflammation in the skin, is to really actually avoid sun for about a week, um, just to reduce any chance of hyperpigmentation or, or, you know, other types of side effects as well. But always just follow the direction that your providers giving you after your treatments. It's very, very important. Yeah, I'm sure they give you a pamphlet and all of that. And there's, you know, plenty of questions you have an opportunity to ask of your provider. Yeah, definitely. So this is a really interesting question here. Yeah. So I've been curious, what is, if I wanted to get, you know, a little bit of a lip injection or filler, what filler is best for this area, the lip area? Yeah. So I have my personal preferences and that's just my personal preferences. Um, there are different nuances to dermal fillers. And a lot of times people think, oh, dermal filler, it's hyaluronic acid, it's totally safe, it's something that's already in our skin. There are side effects with these and your provider will go over those with you. Uh, so I have um, some personal preferences that I prefer to have in mind or that I prefer to use as well. So I would cover that actually in a one-on-one -on -one call. But what we're, what's neat is we're actually seeing different um, long-term effects or trends with some of these uh, with some of these options, which is really interesting. But yeah, you basically just want to follow the science. You know what's determined to be safe and effective. There are some products out there that are going to give you more volume, and some are going to be giving you just more of that like hydrated look. I prefer the hydrated look that isn't going to give a lot of volume. So it's still going to take care of those fine lines or wrinkles without giving you the duck lips. So there are what, different products. Available. What's the ratio of like your bottom lip to your top lip? I love that. And I need to like write that down and keep that somewhere because I think I've got it going on. Yeah. So Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, they spent a lot of time doing sort of like the facial feature analysis and mapping and things like that. Uh, so what I've seen are the lower lip to be about, you know, 1.6 times larger than the upper. However, some people have just naturally this gorgeous fuller lip. What we're seeing more of is that lip lift look where skin is removed here and you get that like mega curl here. So how stupid would I look with them? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's right? not the best look. <laughs> no, it, it wouldn't work with my anatomy. However, what happens to the upper lip here is it drops. So say, for example, I smiled and my lips were like here. Mm -hmm. You don't really see my upper lip. So it depends on what your ratios are doing and, you know, what could be done to augment or slightly adjust that. So... Yeah, I think that's a really great question. It's the proportion. It has to work with your ideal features. And if someone naturally has a fuller upper lip, then that's, you know, quite, that can look actually quite nice. But if someone just, um, you know, is really looking for like the ideal ratios and things like that, which can be achieved 
with um, some non-surgical and surgical options, it's it's a really interesting thing. This is like where everything is sort of like half art, half science, if you will. I love that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how long do these lip fillers last? Are we talking a couple of months, a couple of weeks? Yeah, uh, it can depend on anywhere from a couple of months to like two years. However, I've also seen, this is why I wrote a paper last year, um, dissuading people from uh, tear trough fillers because sometimes the filler here, there's not a lot of like really muscle motion right here. Mm -hmm. So I've seen on people the filler placed here, unfortunately lasting any like up to eight years Ooh. because there's not a lot of motion. So fillers and you know, our normal collagen and elastin will break down depending on, you know, the muscles around and what's happening. Also, people that have thyroid conditions, I do see them burning through their fillers a little bit faster or runners and things like that. Um, yeah, so it's just interesting. There are other products out there as well that are more like biostimulatory and they'll have a longer effect also. So as you guys are gleaning, there's a lot to know in this topic and we're really just scratching the surface and uh, any specific questions, just reach out. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I wonder how often people come like to any clinicians asking for this like Kylie look. Uh, and is that even achievable in like one to two sessions or is that something that would require a longer, um, you know, string of sessions? To, yeah, to get. I, I, I think this question here, like for me particularly, I don't attract people that want the, you know, overdone look. Thank goodness. Um, I do see people that have come to me from other offices and they have been overfilled. And this is a bit of a problem. So I'd like to share this. So for example, there are clinicians out there that say, okay, let's do your lips. Let's use like this entire vial up and you know, if it's too much, just come back and we'll dissolve it. I don't take that approach. I take the approach of less is more. Let's be conservative. Let's put your lip appointment into like a two to three appointment process so that we just slowly build up to the volume that's right for you. Because those little lip lines, they'll pop out and we just don't exactly know when. But in terms of like that really full lip, that's not something that, um, I do. That's not something I'm known for. I'm known for that more like it's just nice, natural. Let's just kind of take care of some of the fine lines, wrinkles, volume loss as it happens. Mm -hmm. uh, however, when I go and teach in bigger cities, the this type of lip is I see it a lot. Um, and it, you'll see bigger cities, um, clinics in bigger cities wanting to provide this for their clients and they'll just do it. So it really depends, right? Sort of where you are in the world, what's the like cultural trend as well, um, because you know a lot of the aesthetic stuff, the ratios, the jawline contouring, it's uh, it's gotten very trendy to the effect that clinicians are giving a very trendy look. Follow the ideal ratios, take care of your skin, live well. That's really the meat of um, aging well and feeling good and looking good in the process. Yeah, I mean, it might be hot right now, but then 20, 30 years down the line, like if you're, you've overdone it and your lips are, you know, in that state, like it's just, you know, you start to to kind of look back and say, oh, oh maybe I made some mistakes. There's a new trend now. It's thin lips, you know? <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I think, I think kind of looking at proportions and some of the art and to the science is, is a really great suggestion. Yeah. Now, when you, if you did say over plump your lips and you're like, Oh, this was a little too much. What is a way to dissolve those fillers? Yeah, well, just that you can actually have some of these products dissolved. Um, just a really big safety piece here. The DIY injectables has become more prominent across the globe. This is not something that you want to go near. There's a lot of training that goes into doing these products safely and also talking about counterfeit beauty products, whether it's skincare, supplements, what you're using in your home, on your body, I do recommend that you either get them straight from the manufacturer or an approved distributor. So what's happened is, I mean, you can just do a YouTube search of the big problem with this. There was actually a conversation on this on the doctor show a couple of months ago with one of my colleagues with, you know, talking about this as a big safety piece. So safety, 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 right? Um, if you have, say, 
who knows what injected from who knows who and it was a sweet deal and then you go and have it try and, and have it adjusted and dissolved and it's not actually filler this will work so there are ways to actually reduce um, overdone features if yes they are in fact hyaluronic acid filler but just avoid you know getting over treated by you know really getting to know your potential provider do you trust them what's the look they have what are some of their before and after photos how do they look how do the staff look how do the people coming in and the office look really get to know um, who you're going to be working with i think this is really great have a good feeling about them enjoy seeing them because it's all this you know this at home and in clinic stuff it's kind of a journey which is actually quite fun and so you want to find someone that's uh that you're going to enjoy doing this stuff with yeah and if you're not happy get a second opinion you know if you're yeah, just going right. to like a doctor and they're like yep you need surgery you're like wait well i'm gonna go make sure that is the actual case and it's like yeah. if you just go into a clinician they're like yeah let's just do all your face you're like wait maybe maybe i'll go see rachel and like actually like you know get a step-by-step -step kind of walkthrough of some of my goals so i think yeah. that's so important and I do that for people all over the world. Um, you know, we were just in summer skin camp. There's people tuning in from London, Iceland, Australia. Melbourne, yeah, all over the US. And um, so I have the ability to actually search for clinics in your area and kind of pick and choose which clinic might be better than others based on technologies they have and that they don't have, believe it or not. Because what clinics don't have also says a lot about the type of clinic they are, because there's a lot of bogus technology out there that's just big time money wasters and things like that. Um, so this, this is a really cool question. I'm excited to answer this one. Yeah, so I was thinking about kind of like the history of injectables, and I know you started about a decade ago. So where has the industry gone since then? And where do you see it going, especially how, how it relates to like environmental and sustainable practices? Yeah, this is so key. Uh, I'm a firm believer in conscious beauty consumerism. You want to be supporting companies that have values that you appreciate. How do they treat their employees? What are their environmental and social practices? Uh, I've been doing this type of investigation with, with my practices for quite some time now. But yes, I want to encourage all of you guys to do that as well. So some of the biggest changes that I've seen, for example, like a frozen forehead, um, you know, the spocked eyebrows, people wanting to get as much of a lift to their eyebrows as possible. But then what happens is it goes beyond those ideal ratios. Um, or for example, just neuromodulators to the full to the upper face and then just fillers to the mid and lower face things like that are kind of evolving uh, right now the trendy thing is like that really prominent sculpted jawline prominent chin full lips you know the tear troughs things like that the tear troughs were a really big trend when i first started um, they still are um, same with like temples and things like that, but there's a lot of problems that can happen with these types of procedures. So you have to find a qualified professional, a highly trained professional, someone who's ongoing learning, and even better if you can find someone who's a teacher because they're typically, um, they have access to some of the latest research. And yes, some products, some of the companies are formulated in a way that when the products are being shipped to clinics, they're either packed in styrofoam containers with dry ice or with these plastic ice packs. And some don't require any cold chain shipments. And obviously, um, I'm happy to share that in a consultation, the differences and we did talk about that earlier. And that's really key for you to understand that when you're getting these treatments done, what's the impact? on the environment and that's that's really key because i find when companies care about the environment they also care about a, a lot of other stuff too mm -hmm. that is the truth now um i know like that the kim kardashian vampire facial thing got such a big buzz around it in the last few years and we have seen a lot more um celebrities and influencers kind of doing these these practices so can you talk to us about what a vampire facial facial procedure actually involves yeah so what's kind of cool well, well i mean i don't know about that but <laughs> i would say that like social media and instagram got really kind of like 
big from this one particular family, um, you know, posting their photos and like these highly contoured sculpted faces and, and things like that. And then what, they, what, what happened was, um, you know, they started to share the treatments they were getting. Um, I think there were ties to particular, you know, products or procedures or clinics as well. So when you're seeing different people talk about things, do keep that into consideration also. So when we're thinking of that, you know, bloody face and, and things like that, uh, that's typically what's considered um, is sort of like a microneedling with um, certain types of uh, products applied onto the skin. And I actually love alternatives to this that uh, actually with, with, um, with these types of treatments, there is actually some waste as well that's created when you're you know drawing blood and centrifuging uh, different constituents like your platelet rich plasma out from your blood and then putting it on the skin. I actually really prefer um, some laser options to this. However, um, there are actually some some really great before and after photos that I've seen with uh, some of these other procedures, which we'll talk about. Uh, but yeah, that was kind of like a really famous photo that we all saw. And for me personally, that's not a specific treatment that I've bothered to have done. I've gone through some other options, which uh, I can share in a in a one-on-one -on -one call. Yeah, and so um, so this would be kind of like a the PRP facial, basically. Yes. And what are people really hoping to achieve from something like that? Mm -hmm. Other than some really great Instagram scary photos. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, everyone's looking for that magical cream, that sort of like magic pill. And so unfortunately, what happens, I think, with a lot of these specific treatments is, you know, people are like, oh, I have acne scarring, I want to improve this feature, that feature. And then it's just like, okay, here, here, just do this one thing, and it's going to do everything. However, I'm a firm believer in actually layering things and looking at like, especially your at home and your lifestyle as sort of like these pieces of the puzzle, if you will. And yeah, there, there are some other really great ways, um, cost effective ways to stimulate your collagen and things like that. Uh, but I did want to talk about this because um, like PRP and things like that. I think that this is going to be a really cool um I think the evolution of the landscape of injectables is just going to continue to skyrocket. You know, the future of regenerative medicine is going as customized as possible. Uh, having some of these conversations with some of the top health and wellness icons on my podcast and being interviewed by them, I'm learning so much. And then I get to share it with you guys, which is really, really great. Uh, PRP, I've had a number of my colleagues say that it's helpful for um, you know, different things, right? So I'm happy to share that with you. Um, but yeah, before and afters, always look at the scientific literature and the data, what's happening there, what's been published, and then go for that seven, eight year rule. Because typically when we see these newer treatments come out, about seven or eight years, the protocols are more dialed in, which means they're going to be more like there's going to be more efficacy, hopefully, um, if this is in fact a good option and the, the um, ways of applying it and outcome just gets better and better and better with time. So that's why I'm not a fan of just like jumping on the bandwagon of what the latest influencer is talking about. But then there's also like some really cool people, biohackers out there that are just like doing a lot of these things themselves, um, getting them done. And, and, you know, this is how innovation happens. It's by trying things if the science makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then um, when it comes to some of the gentler alternatives to say PRP treatment, I know you had touched on something like a laser. Is there anything else that people could kind of dip their toes into that um, realm before they just go straight into the, the hardcore microneedling? Yeah, well, I mean, you can kind of do needling at home <laughs> with dermal rolling, which um, is pretty cost effective. So if you're on a budget, that's really an option. Um, there's tons of research on collagen induction therapy out there, decades actually. You can just start to do some of the research yourself, but don't go buy a roller off this third party website from who knows who 
Um, and, you know, even if you're looking for a roller off these third party websites and it looks the same, it says it's all this brand and it looks just like this. Well, you know, that, again, I'm going to reference my analogy of that Louis Vuitton handbag looks the same online too, but it might not be the same. So when in doubt, you know, get your items, your skincare products, your devices and things like that through qualified distributors. And if you're not sure, you can just send a quick message to the manufacturer um, because you might want to be supporting certain individuals, but you want to do your due diligence that they are in fact approved to distribute these options. So gentler alternatives to injectables is absolutely what I love to recommend. So do your skincare, your lasers, your at-home stuff, live well, and then, you know, maybe the injectables for what's left over because they do have a place and they can actually, um, you know, really improve like the glassiness to the skin. Um, there's some anecdotal information coming out for, you know, decreasing the humidity of the skin to even improve things like frequency of breakouts and oil production. That's all very anecdotal. I look forward to some studies coming out to support that. Um, but yeah, even some injectables can be helpful for, you know, assisting with acne scarring as well. Uh, but yeah, more gentler, these are all considered non-surgical options. Sometimes a surgical option might be the right option for you. So that's why meeting with um, a professional can be great. And it's just always like if you have a skin goal, you don't just want to be starting to do like Google and YouTube searches. You really have to meet with an expert to see what's right for you on many different levels you're going to save a lot of time and money by doing by taking this approach as well mm -hmm. in my experience for sure once you go down that rabbit hole of google oh my gosh it's hard to pull yourself out yeah you're like, I, oh. I did it back in the day too, right? <laughs> like how do i feel faster from this how do i yeah maybe before to like get a better healing, reducing bruising, swelling, things like that. There's so much mm -hmm. misinformation out there though. And I'm just here to keep you guys on the straight and narrow. Yeah, I love it. So this is a really fun conversation around uh, sort of like glassy skin and alternatives and just like a live Q&A call. So we were actually able to address some of the um, questions that pop through here in this conversation. So thanks so much for everyone who participated. This was really fun. And I always love collaborating with you, Katie. You just like, you ask the best questions. Oh, well, you answer them in the best way possible. So there we go. <laughs> awesome. I always love collaborating with you too. Yeah, so please reach out if you have any questions. Um, you can book a call with me at rachelvarga.ca from anywhere in the world. I can help you prioritize things in accordance to your skin goals, your budget, your lifestyle, all of that. Also, I teach uh, internationally other aesthetic physicians and nurses. Uh, I love teaching on the subject. You can hang out with me here on Facebook at Rachel Varga Official on Facebook, Instagram, the YouTube channel, the Rachel Varga podcast. I'm here to help you guys just make smarter decisions for aging impossibly well on the inside and out through blending your body, mind, and spirit to really cultivate this higher level of beauty and radiance, which is very different than what we're seeing in social media and which is kind of like epitomized to us. We need to take a step back and really understand that you know health and wellness is a priority but if something makes you feel good you get joy from it it's okay to prioritize that so just do what's right for you and then katie where can people find you as well you can find me at katie type a on all platforms um, and especially my youtube channel if you can head over there and click subscribe uh, i do weekly product videos um, on all things biohacking and i actually have a couple videos with rachel up there too so you should definitely go check those out yeah, we just have so much fun collaborating and sharing. And I just really appreciate you coming to me and like, you know, compiling all these questions for me <laughs> to answer because these are questions I get all the time. So happy to help. Awesome. Thanks everyone for joining. And until next time, we'll see you guys in the next episode here on the Rachel Varga podcast, the YouTube channel, Facebook, or Instagram. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Katie. Thanks. Bye.